Just over a year ago, in March of 2020, unemployment in the US spiked to 15% as the fallout of the coronavirus forced many businesses to close and many more to take drastic cost-cutting measures to survive the turbulent times that lay ahead. Today, thanks in part to government stimulus and a new acceptance of the status quo in the workplace, this figure has fallen to 6%, which is still far higher than the 3.5% it was hovering around before the economy shut down, but it is obviously a massive improvement. In fact, today, the USA is facing a completely different, somewhat paradoxical problem. People are no longer struggling to find places to work, workplaces are struggling to find people. Reports of massive labour shortages have compelled some of the nation's largest employers to offer potential recruits $50 just to show up for a job interview. Here in Australia, Uber is offering people a $500 bonus just to sign up as a driver and do 20 deliveries. What's more is that those same companies are having to offer higher salaries and career progression opportunities beyond the minimum wage they have typically paid to entry level employees. So this sounds like a good thing. Unemployment falling, wages rising, conditions improving. What's not to like? Unless maybe you're a fast food franchise owner. However, these seemingly positive headlines have actually got a few economists pretty worried. To understand why, we need to as always look at a few things in detail and properly understand what this could all mean to the recovery of the American economy as a whole. So why are economists concerned about people having their choice of jobs with better pay and conditions? What could this situation do to the wider economy? And what is the best way to take advantage of this apparent surge in demand for new employees? This episode of Economics Explained is brought to you by Skillshare. Thanks to Skillshare, you can learn valuable skills that will make you a marketable asset no matter what the world is doing. It's a hotbed of knowledge that employers from all over the world wish you had. Their platform provides you with unlimited access to thousands of high quality tutorials on virtually every subject imaginable from video editing to cooking. Stay tuned until the end to learn more or be the first 1,000 viewers to sign up using the link in the video description below to receive a completely free trial of Skillshare Premium. After your trial, it's only 10 bucks a month with an annual plan. So pause the video right now, be one of the first 1,000 viewers and see what all the hype is about. The link is in the video description below. So you have probably heard the phrase full employment. It gets thrown around a lot by politicians, economists, and it's even one of the central goals of the Federal Reserve Bank. But the actual phrase itself, full employment, is a bit misleading. You would be forgiven for thinking that this means zero unemployment, but it doesn't. For starters, that's never actually been achieved because in an economy as large as the US, there is always going to be someone out of work. So what does it actually mean? Well, economists kind of disagree on this. They all agree it is a low rate of unemployment, but it will never be zero. The first approximation of this is based on what is called the natural rate of unemployment. What this means is that the only people who are willing and able to work but are not currently working are either temporarily between jobs, like let's say an executive taking a week off before starting a new role at a new company, or are training up to work in a different role, like let's say a blacksmith learning to write code so that they can go and work at Google. Yeah, okay, extreme example, but you get the point. This is known as frictional and structural unemployment respectively. These are normally seen as the good type of unemployment, or at least the type of unemployment that isn't terrible, like the alternatives. Cyclical unemployment is the one that we are normally afraid of. This is unemployment caused by changes in the business cycle. If an economy goes into a recession, there is naturally less demand, which means fewer employees are needed to meet that lower level of demand, people are laid off and lose their income, so they can't afford to purchase as much, which in turn reduces demand, and the cruel cycle of cyclical unemployment continues. I must quickly add before anyone corrects me in the comments section that cyclical unemployment is so called because it is caused by the short term business cycle, not because it compounds on itself like demonstrated here. That's just a nice little piece of irony that I like to point out. Anyway, this is why to try and avoid this, the central bank is tasked with among other things, maintaining full employment. But that role can sometimes be at odds with another responsibility of the Fed, which is maintaining low inflation. There is another idea of what full employment is, and it has to do with a term that you may have heard thrown around in the news recently, the NARU, which is just an acronym for the Non-Accelerating Inflation Rate of Unemployment. 
This is the reason that economists don't want zero unemployment. First analysed by William Phillips, he found that there was a relationship between the unemployment rate and inflation. Notably, higher levels of employment, higher levels of inflation. But it's not a linear relationship. Sure, as employment levels rise, so too does inflation. But it only really starts to become a problem when it passes this arbitrary point, the Nehru. Now this graph may look daunting, but the actual fundamentals of this theory couldn't be more simple. It's supply and demand. Imagine a world with 10% unemployment. It shouldn't be that difficult, it was literally the world a year ago. If you are the unlucky one out of every 10 that finds themselves involuntarily out of work, then you are in trouble. Any job opening is going to have a lot of potential applicants, and a lot of applicants that will be willing to work for rock bottom wages just so that they can get a job at all. It's worth mentioning that this also really sucks for the frictionally and structurally unemployed as well, because they might be training up for or transitioning into jobs that don't exist anymore. Ultimately, the labour market is a market like any other, and more people looking for fewer jobs means that there is more supply, less demand, and ultimately lower wages. Now, the opposite is also true, but to a more extreme degree. Say unemployment drops below this Nehru level, then we will have a situation where almost everybody that wants a job has a job. If you are an employer and you post a job opening, you might find that literally nobody applies. So maybe you have to offer a slightly higher salary, or poach people from other workplaces with attractive signing bonuses. Or you know, maybe even pay people $50 just to show up for a job interview. Now a little bit of this is great. It gives the working pool of labour a bit more negotiating power. It means that people don't need to work 80 hours a week in a coal mine or deal with environments that will obviously impact their long-term health. But too much can cause a problem. There is certainly a good argument for a higher minimum wage. But what happens if restaurants need to turn around and start paying all of their employees 15, 20, 40, $100 an hour just to attract enough staff to make sure the operation runs? Eventually, the salary expenses of these businesses would just make it infeasible for them to keep on running, which means they will close down, which reduces the supply of tasty burgers in circulation, which means that the burger places that are left in operation will get to charge a premium for their products being sold in the burger market that they have now cornered. Of course, this is an extreme example. But even gradual increases in income can lead to gradual increases in the price level of goods and services. If a company needs to pay a plumber $30 an hour to get them to show up to work, they're going to be passing that cost along to you. And on the other side of that equation, if that plumber is looking for a brand new truck to celebrate his pay rise, he's going to be competing against every other plumber that just got a pay rise and wants to buy themselves a brand new truck. Now, I know what you might be thinking. Oh, Mr Economics Man just wants to complain about inflation again. Didn't you make a video on this last month? And well, while that is half true, there is more to this whole problem than just inflation alone. Beyond that, this is ignoring the glaring elephant in the room, which is that unemployment is still almost twice of what it was before the pandemic. If this wasn't a problem back then, why is it a problem now? The short answer is that the Nehru has shifted, but that only makes sense when you address the bigger picture. You are never going to see a politician campaign on a platform of increasing unemployment and offering less jobs to less Americans for a few reasons. Obviously, it would be incredibly unpopular with 99% of the people who either don't know what Nehru is or think at the very least it's a tiny micronation in the South Pacific. But beyond that, increasing unemployment is very easy. It's as simple as cancelling a few government projects. The challenge is more so in keeping unemployment as low as possible without racking up too much debt or inflation. The government tries very hard to get this figure as low as possible because it is politically popular. This is either done directly through employing people in government roles as government contractors, or indirectly by generally running an expansionary fiscal budget where not a lot of money is taxed but a lot of money is given away. The problem with this second option is that it can create a whole new category of unemployment that doesn't get nearly as much attention as these other ones. Institutional unemployment. This is unemployment that is caused by institutional policies that impact the labour market. 
This can be anything from a mine getting shut down because the workers threaten to unionise, to companies refusing to hire workers of a particular race or gender, but more commonly it has to do with government intervention in markets. There is an argument being made by a broad group of economists today that the measures taken to protect people from the direct economic repercussions of the coronavirus were too generous. Unemployment insurance, combined with supplements of up to $300 per week, compounded by multiple stimulus checks, have meant that people are making more money by not working than they would be making in the industries which are hurting. When it's also considered that going to work also includes hidden costs like paying for transport to and from the workplace, childcare, eating out more because you don't have time to cook at home, then this decision makes logical fiscal sense. What's more is that there is still a global pandemic going on. Given the choice between staying home or working in food services where you'll come into contact with hundreds of people in a given day, I think I would know which choice I would take. I know this is anecdotal, but I would like to think I'm the type of guy that values a solid day's work and normally given this decision I would choose to earn my own money rather than take assistance, even if the earning potential was the same. But given the context of the world that we live in right now, you would need to pay me a pretty healthy premium for taking that risk. Now, this entire process effectively means that the non-accelerating inflation rate of unemployment that we were studying earlier can shift. And indeed it shifts all the time. Following the recession in 2008, this rate spiked up by 1% to just under 6%. Of course, that never really became a problem because unemployment at this time was hovering over 8%. But today, we are in a potentially worse economic situation than we were back then, given that there are real material constraints on the economy. There are not enough computer chips, not enough lumber, not enough cars, and not enough of basically everything we use to run an economy, which is kind of to be expected. Let's not ignore the fact that we are still in a crisis right now. It should only make sense that unemployment should be higher, and the relentless obsession by governments to drive this figure to be as low as possible is driving it beyond where it actually should be in a properly functioning economy, which is giving us all of the weirdness that we are seeing in the world right now. Economists that support this theory, primarily those that subscribe to the Austrian School of Economics, will also point out that these distortions will cause knock-on impacts in the economy that will end up doing more harm than good. If that plumber from earlier, who is currently earning $30 an hour, has to go back to working for $20 an hour, he might default on the payments for that new Ford F-150 he overpaid for, which causes more issues than these temporarily higher wages solved. A rough analogy would be that COVID hit the global economy like an unexpected breakup. Now, there are two ways to deal with a breakup. You can realise that this is going to suck for a while, take some steps to try and make yourself feel better and get over it. Or you could go on a bender, which will almost totally eliminate the pain and suffering in the short term, but inevitably make things much worse in the long term. It must be noted that not all economists agree with this rather pessimistic view. Some argue that this is simply a systematic issue that will sort itself out over time. This also does make sense when you look at the figures. As we saw, at the height of the pandemic, millions of people were laid off in a very short period of time. In the months since then, those people have had to find alternatives to support themselves. This could be anything from going back to school to retrain, to living off government welfare, to simply just getting a new job. Life finds a way, so to speak. Fast forward to today, and those same businesses are reopening and looking to fill out their staff base all over again, only to find that all the people they had let go had found these other arrangements. Job openings right now are at the highest point in history. And sure, some of the people that were laid off will either be happy or be forced to come back to work, but some will end up sticking with the alternatives that they have found during the lockdown. Over time, this will even itself back out. New people will join the workforce and eventually there won't be as many businesses that need to hire staff to reopen. Everybody lives happily ever after, so to speak. But what can you do to capitalise on all of this? Well, now is the perfect time to start shopping around for a new job with a better salary. For the first time in a long time, it is the employers fighting over the employees, rather than the other way around. Studies suggest that employees who stay with their companies for longer than two years get paid 50% less on average than their peers who are more happy to job hop for a promotion, a pay rise, or just better conditions. 
Getting the best value for your hard work is always good advice, but maybe never more so than right now. Of course, this process is made even easier by being able to leverage an ever-expanding set of valuable and marketable skills like the ones that you can learn with Skillshare. Thanks to Skillshare, learning in-demand skill sets has never been easier. The Economics Explain team has recently brought on a full-time video editor, which you may have noticed thanks to all of the beautiful graphs and animations that we now have in our videos. I say this not only to show off this massive quality improvement, but also to say that finding someone to do this job was hard. Almost every applicant we went through just didn't have the skills that we were looking for, but obviously we did end up finding someone who learned everything that they know online with Skillshare. This is a good job that can be done from anywhere in the world, and it goes to show the power of having an in-demand skill that is taught by an engaging teacher who truly knows their craft and uses it themselves in the real world. Of course, maybe video editing is not your thing, or maybe you don't have grand ambitions of becoming a digital nomad. That's fine. There are thousands of courses available on Skillshare that range anywhere from cool tricks to impress your friends, all the way up to core competencies that you could build a career of. And guys, here's the best part. The first 1,000 of you to sign up using the link in the video description below will receive a completely free trial of Skillshare Premium, providing you with instant and unlimited access to the entire Skillshare platform. After that, it's only 10 bucks a month. Again, the link is in the video description below. Thanks for watching, mate. Bye.